Osterman is a distinguished graduate of the Air Force Reserve Officer Training Corps. While waiting active duty orders, he worked as a research analyst supporting multiple kinetic energy programs of the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. Y'all know that's Star Wars. Aside from his over 3,000 flight hours and combat tours, he also served as a commander of a NATO flying training squadron. Colonel Testerman was the elite presidential advance agent for President George W. Bush's landing on the USS Abraham Lincoln. Y'all remember that? His plan. He was Chief of Defensive Fighter Operations for the Combined Air Operations Center in Greece and the AFROTC, Air Force ROTC, Detachment Commander at the University of New Hampshire. He serves part-time now as a law enforcement officer in New Hampshire and as a police chaplain. He is a passionate advocate and speaker for the concerns of veterans and military members as well as their families. I've gotten to know him over the past few days. John Guandolo, I know many of y'all have been at our John Guandolo talks, he introduced us to Colonel Testerman and we are so grateful. So please give a warm welcome for Colonel Testerman. controversy about that, but hey, you ought to go visit their website. Uh, there is uh, absolutely nothing uh, underhanded or, or underboard about them. They've got a whole section on financial accountability. I believe uh, the last several years you've been at 93 to 98% of your budget going to uh, uh, Wounded Warrior programs. Uh, and, and Something I, I just learned about them this week, but uh, something I really appreciate is it's not just a place to send money to, it's a place to put your hands to work. And that's very, very important. And that uh, honestly tells veterans uh, more about how you care for them than, uh, than opening your wallet. So thank you for what you all do. Um, I'd also like to thank, I know we've got lots of veterans in the, in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, if, if you'd raise your hands at least, I'd, I'd like to uh, recognize you all. veteran. I know we've got some Vietnam veterans here. If nobody's told you this already, uh, welcome home. Uh, it's, it's sad that, that you weren't told that when you came home initially. Uh, it's been really neat to sort of see the small world here. I also uh, just found out that uh, uh, the parents of my, uh, uh, of my college classmate uh, from Norwich University are here, uh, Bob Al uh, Mistress Al Athley and uh, um, my, my son, uh, or my, my son, my, my classmate Chris Athley. Uh, is their son, and, and uh, what, a, what a cool surprise that was uh, there. And uh, he's now reti a retired colonel. Uh, uh, so uh, another another proud uh, uh, proud Norwich tradition uh, living on there. Uh, we've got so much to be thankful uh, for in this world, and uh, uh, not just the, the beautiful weather here, but all the blessings of this country. And I'm going to talk about some things today that that are going to be, sound a little bit painful, but I want to put that all into perspective first. Um, I'm happy to be here uh, to talk to you, not just because I'm passionate about the military and, and veterans and our na nation's security, uh, which I am, uh, but I'm passionate about virtue-based leadership. I'm going to talk a bit about what I mean with that. But also, I'm happy to be here because we are obviously in a key and pivotal, pivotal time in history. Uh, not just because of the March 15th uh, primary that you've got coming up here, but uh, just an opportunity throughout our nation to make some changes. But before we go further, let me talk about some perspective. This is a, <clears throat> what it looks like from the cockpit of, a, of an F-15 at about 50,000 feet. And when you're at 50,000 feet, uh, you're above the, uh, most of the moisture uh, that's in our atmosphere. And so your visibility is just about unlimited 
Matter of fact, you can see that the curvature of the Earth is about 274 miles. Uh, that means from that seat, you can see about 236,000 square miles. And that seems like a whole lot. Um, when, you, when you're seeing that, you know, the Louis Armstrong's words sort of come into mind, oh, what a beautiful world. But even at that altitude and, and all that you can see, you're only seeing a fraction of 196 million square miles on this Earth. But if we go a little bit further, uh, if you've walked at night and you've looked up and seen this, uh, the, the W constellation of Cassiopeia, and, uh, Cassiopeia, and, and you look off to, to the right where that's circled, uh, that's the, the furthest star we can see. That's about 8,000 light years away. And the only reason we can see it is it's about 100,000 times brighter than our sun. Uh, the farthest object we can see is, is about uh, 2.25 million light years away. That's the Andromeda Galaxy. And science estimates that our whole universe is 40,000 times larger than that. The 93 billion light years. That's just what we can see with all of our technology that we have. But I want to tell you something else about that. As vastly and incomprehensibly huge as that universe is, this is the truth. Our God is much bigger than that. We serve a great God, and it's so great that Scripture says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. So what does this have to do with the security of our nation? Everything. Because the only security, I believe, that matters is the security that comes from God. And how amazing are the blessings of God on this republic? Blessings don't just include our geography and our materials and our people, uh, the opportunities and skills, what a form of government represented by the papers uh, this image represents, uh, the Declaration and the, and the Constitution that followed that. Blessings which give, I believe, clear evidence that God has great plans for this nation. And we need to have this in perspective because despite our best efforts to do otherwise, uh, as much as we try to mess things up, God's plans are not going to be thwarted. So let's keep that perspective in mind. And as I uh, talk about some things that are going to be painful, let's keep that hope alive as well. And I'll hopefully wrap this up uh, with a, an opportunity for you to see a way forward uh, when we've been trying to do our best to go backwards. As much as we've turned away from the blessings of liberty, we have hope in that great, great God. Today we do live in a time where security, and more importantly, liberty, are threatened. We have threats in the form of terrorism, state-level enemies, and sometimes even our own government. In society, and, and this is not a situation, however, that is unknown in the history of our nation. Matter of fact, 230 years ago, our forefathers were facing deadly and disruptive threats of their own. And, and though some of those threats may have had different names than we face today, they had identical goals to rob us of liberty and scare us away from the path laid before us by our Creator. And just as during that time, our nation's very existence depended on its men and women to stand up against the, the atmosphere of fear, against those threats, and to do so at the expense of their comfort, their lives, of their riches, our nation today depends on us to do the same thing. And today, I will argue, is a perfect time to do so. It's a time because of how far we have fallen. We have also unparalleled opportunities to explain and to illustrate to our fellow citizens the consequences of an extended period in which we have, our leaders have not only failed to follow the, virtu or the principles of virtue-based leadership, but they've been openly hostile to them. Yet we're also in a key election year We've got opportunities to influence, to shape, and select our leaders, and to demand virtue, virtuous leadership from them. And I believe we are also in the crux of a revival in our families, in our communities, in our nation, evidenced by groups like this, by groups like Civitas last weekend, by groups all over the nation who are gathering to learn, but more importantly, to learn how to act. And I pray that this will lead to action, not only this year, but in building and preparing virtuous leaders for the future. We are a blessed country. 
in so many ways. And I believe that it is our responsibility to act, to be good stewards of this. We've been blessed abundantly by our Creator with ge geography, natural resources, people, ingenuity, industry, so many things. We have not only the ability, but the calling to be good stewards of this gift, these blessings. Again, Scripture says, Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. I believe this speaks not only to the spiritual gifts, but to the material as well. President Reagan said, The manifold blessings on this nation give us the ability, the duty, and the responsibility to be a city on the hill. So although I am saddened by the lack of integrity, the lack of virtue-based leadership in this country, the self-service rather than the self-sacrifice of many of our leaders, uh, the dereliction of duty, the consequences, the devastating consequences of all of this, I am encouraged by the opportunities that lie before us today. So again, much of what I'm going to say over the next bit is going to be discouraging, but take hope. We have a great opportunity, and we have a great destiny before us. And I hope by the end of my talk, you will be inspired to act. That we can become, again, an America, that city on the hill, a shining beacon of hope for others. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, today about four instruments of national po uh, power. And if you're a stu student of national security strategy, you've probably heard these before. We use the acronym DIME, and they're uh, diplomacy, information and intelligence, military and economy. So an acronym of DIME. And the symptoms of our decline in our nation are myriad, and they go through all four of these. Diplomacy is our interaction with, uh, with other nations, information and intelligence, uh, how we uh, project our information, how we protect our information, how we project a vision, our military, how we protect our republic, and the economy uh, is often one of our, our most neglected instruments of national power. Once the United States was known as the world's greatest superpower, and today maybe not so much, as we see the, the rising economies of, uh, and, and power of China in particular, of India, of other countries, uh, as, as we've begun to fall. These instruments of national power, those which flow from them, are what we as a nation can use to defend and project the principles of liberty and influence the world with the blessings we've been given. And I don't think I'm making any great revelation to any of you by saying that we are in serious decline in all of these. Our diplomatic failures are myriad. We squandered our diplomatic influence, turning against our staunchest and most uh, important allies, including Israel. And we've failed to hold up our responsibilities to new allies like Ukraine. Our awkward attempts to pander to and appease our rivals have turned strength into weakness, capital into debt. America has gone from a leader to a laughingstock in global diplomacy. Allies no longer trust us, and our enemies no longer respect us. Back in 2002, I had the honor of being an Air Force Advance Agent uh, for Je President uh, George W. Bush's visit to Lithuania. He was coming to visit uh, Lithuania to invite them into the NATO alliance. Uh, it was a great opportunity. Uh, it was probably a lot like people felt uh, liberating uh, countries right after World War II, the way we were treated. They were very excited. Got to know many locals. One, one man told us that during the Soviet occupation, his family had been branded disloyal and had been moved to a Siberian labor camp. Uh, while they were there, uh, his brother had died. And uh, when they came back, they were blacklisted. And when he looked for a job growing up, he had, uh, uh, the only thing he could get was a job at the airport as the janitor. When Lithuania became independent after the fall of the Soviet Union, this industrious man worked his way up through the ranks so that when I met him, he was the manager of the capital's airport. President Bush, in his speech, said this. Many doubted that freedom would come to this country, but the United States always recognized an independent Lithuania. The long night of fear 
uncertainty, and loneliness is over. You are joining the strong and growing family of NATO. Our alliance has made a solemn pledge of protection, and anyone who would choose Lithuania as an enemy has also made an enemy of the United States. In the face of aggression, the brave people of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia will never stand alone. The day after the president left, the airport manager told one of our team members another story. He said he returned home and found his father crying in the living room. He asked his dad, oh, why are you crying? He said, I remember when Poland invaded, and then later when the Russians invaded, and then the Nazis, and then the Russians again. But today I heard the President of the United States say that anyone who would be our enemy would be the enemy of the United States of America. And I realized the invasions are over. When I heard that story, I have to confess, I was pretty proud to be an American. I actually cried a bit, and I, um, for good reason. What a privilege to be part of a country that can bring that kind of hope to the world. To a man who spent time in a labor camp, who lost a son, who saw multiple invasions of his country, to have so much hope brought to him uh, by the words of a president who met them. But then uh, in 2015, I saw another story that brought tears to my eyes as well. This is a story that comes in with a, a, an article about a publication that the Lithuanian government uh, put out in January of 2015. So only about 13 years after the president's visit to Lithuania, a different president's. Story begins, uh, and by the way, the name of this is uh, What We Need to Know how to act in extreme situations or instances of war. When Russia started its aggression in Ukraine, our citizens here in Lithuania understood that our neighbor is not friendly, said the Lithuanian defense minister in an interview with Reuters. The examples of Georgia and Ukraine, both, by the way, under NATO's protection and given promises of protection by our country, show us that we cannot rule out a similar kind of situation here. Let that sink in. Just over a decade earlier, an old man, a former prisoner in a Siberian labor camp, was sitting in his living room crying tears of joy at the end of invasions. And now they are publishing a booklet about what to do in the next invasion. He was crying before on a promise he believed in given by a president of our country. And now he doesn't trust those words. He doesn't trust them because this is what Ukraine looks like as we sat by idly. Let me read some passages from this book. Keep a sound mind. Don't lose clear thinking. Gunshots outside your window are not the end of the world. Well, gunshots outside your window may not be the end of the world, but I had an opportunity to see what might have been. You see, in the town of, or what might be, and the town of Vilnius in the old KGB headquarters is now the Lithuanian Museum of Genocide. It preserves the history of what life in Lithuania was like under the Soviets. Here's some of the pictures from it. It's curated by a former inmate of, of the uh, prison. About a half million Lithuanians were killed. Many more were imprisoned, tortured, and terrorized. And as disturbing as it is, it is a and it's very disturbing. It gave me a small glimpse of what came to that old man's mind when he thought about the real fears of another Soviet occupation. And again, this time I cried tears of, of shame rather than pride. How far we've we fallen in a short time. When our promises have no meaning, our enemies will not respect us and our allies cannot trust us. This is not virtuous leadership. It is vicious manipulation, and it can't continue. I'm only on the first point. <laughs> Information and intelligence is the next instrument of national power. While our diplomatic standing has been in free fall, the instrument of power we call information has been deteriorated as well. Information covers a wide range of disciplines. It starts with the vision we can convey to our own citizens as well as to the world. And 
looking in, back into our own history, we can sort of see uh, how the country used to be sort of the, the Superman image, right? Truth, justice, and the American way. That's what you thought of when you thought of uh, America. You know, America during World War II, we think of these pictures, pe energizing people to action. Our, our country using the bully pulpit of the presidency of all our areas of, of leadership to get people moving towards things, whether it was buying war bond, bonds, joining the military, or doing a rubber or, or metal drive. Information also includes uh, information <coughs> security, making sure that we take care of our own information, keeping it secure, whether it's the nation's information or the, that of uh, individual citizens, and uh, uh, exploiting others when necessary. <laughs> this is information security in today's era, right? Now, we can see that uh, the deterioration of that is in full scale. And I would argue that a lot of this is due to the failure for our leaders to apply the principles of virtue-based leadership. Intelligence, ga intelligence gathering resources, instead of being used against enemy information, are now being used against our own people. And we can't seem to, to guard our own information ourselves, even when you're Secretary of State. When it comes to security, we prove that we're unable to protect even the most highly classified information. That which we call top secret, which means that it can cause grave damage to our country if released. And our highest government officials are committing ethical, moral, and legal offenses, jeopardizing and compromising such classified information and the lives it protects. And we offer her the opportunity to become our next president. These are dangerous times indeed, and it is not virtuous leadership at all, but vicious manipulation. The military is in decline as well, and misuse. As Desert Storm was winding down, we were already winding down the size of our military, so much so that on the eve of 9-11, we were 30% smaller than we had been uh, just a few years prior. After those attacks, we sent people uh, not just to Iraq and Afghanistan, but all over the world. Here's just some of them. I read this at Civitas, and, and I apologize for reading a list, but you need to hear this. Not only have we sent people to Iraq and Kuwait and Afghanistan, but Zaire, Sierra Leone, Bosnia, Somalia, Macedonia, Haiti, Liberia, Central African Republic, Albania, Congo, Gabon, Cambodia, Guinea-Bissau, Kenya, Tanzania, Afghanistan, Sudan, East Timor, Serbia, Kosovo, Nigeria, Yemen, Cote d'Ivoire, Georgia, Djibouti, Pakistan, Lebanon, Libya, Uganda, Jordan, Chad, Mali, Syria, and so many other places we don't even know about. The skies above, the water below. One of the ICON members mentioned asked me, how come you didn't mention North Korea? And I said, well, we're not in North Korea. Well, yes, we are in their waters right now. We are just about everywhere. We, our deployment rate of our troops has gone up while the number of, of troops has gone down. It stressed us to the breaking point. Our active forces are stretched thin. Our reserves are already committed or overcommitted. And it's no longer possible for units to redeploy reconstitute and replenish. Multiple deployments are standard. We've got 19 year olds on their second deployment. We've got 25 year olds on their fifth deployment. We've got career people looking at eight or more deployments in a career. That's just ridiculous. We are sacrificing our military members and their families for the idols of comfort and false security. And because of that, for a large uh, portion this responsibility falls on this. We lose 22 veterans a day to suicide. And they kill themselves, lives that couldn't be taken on the battlefield, taken by themselves. Meanwhile, when we do commit our military members to the battlefield, we repeat the mistakes of our past military failures. By hampering our commanders and forces with a combination of overly restrictive and intricate rules of engagement and risk-averse senior commanders and unclear or non-existent strategies. And finally, centralized control and centralized execution. Marja is a town or a village in the center of the Helmand province in Afghanistan. 
this January, members of the 19th Special Operations Group, some of the forces that the administration told us were not in combat, uh, found themselves surrounded by a, a much superior uh, enemy force. One member uh, was killed. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, today's Wall Street Journal, uh, the cover photo is of his Arlington funeral, his young son receiving a folded flag, Sergeant Matthew McClintock. He was killed, two were wounded. Those wounded members took 12 hours to evacuate them because of timid commanders that would not send in rescue forces, even though the, the rest of the deployed 19th Special Operations Group was only a short distance away. One, shop, one chopper that did come in to uh, rescue the wounded was uh, downed, and they, the uh, Special Operations Forces found themselves in for the long night with no rescue forces at, at all. Matter of fact, it would have been faster to dispatch rescue forces from another continent than the ones that were held under NATO control and not released. The AC-130 that was put over, it's a gunship aircraft, was put overhead to keep them safe through the night. It was not allowed to engage the enemy for fear of collateral damage. The only thing they were allowed to do was put two 40 millimeter shells in an empty field as a show of force. The plot of our Special Forces troops was discussed briefly at a Pentagon uh, press conference that, that day with friendly forces uh, represented as a small dotted green surrounded by all this red. And then we had a news blackout for 48 hours. Nobody talked about it. And more importantly, the media didn't even ask the question. And so Americans didn't know what was going on. Matter of fact, uh, the day after the first briefing, I, I looked on Google. I could find two news stories on the Google search that it had occurred within the past 24 hours. Both of them were regurgitations of the, of the previous day's press conference. Meanwhile, Google had 1,400 stories on the Powerball lottery. When such travesties occur, or expected to occur as a result of our disjointed civilian uh, leadership, our military leaders themselves are presented with difficult choices. Accept the decisions of the leaders above them or provide vigorous and appropriate dissent. But we've seen what happens when you dissent with this administration. <coughs> Under this administration, that dissent ends in your quick dismissal. Sometimes outright, as in the case of General McChrystal on the left, uh, sometimes through suspicious circumstances when we talk about General Petraeus and General Hamm. The result has been a filtering of our senior leaders into one that is increasingly filled with either timid and risk averse or with the careerist guessman. Our nation's leadership's strange combination of overzealous and unrestrained deployment, lack of accountability, meddling micromanagement, and unreasonable handcuffing, unclear communication, and intolerance of dissent is a grave threat to our national security. And our Congress's cowardly lack of Accountability or holding accountability, our, uh, our executive branch is just as devastating. Again, it's not virtuous leadership, vi vicious manipulation. And this brings us into our economy, our road to ruin. Usually, an upward graph is good, but this is our debt, right? And that's not a good trend at all. The final classic instrument of national power is the economy. And there should be no argument that we're in trouble here, too. Deficit spending once reserved for relatively short-term things like war or crises is now the norm, and it's become exponential. We are unconscionably subjecting our children to a crushing national debt. Our children's children, our children's children, children will not be able to pay this off. Some of this is because what I mentioned earlier uh, about our two and a half decades of undeclared and constant war. A military at war, without a nation at war, leads to deficit spending. Again, in World War II, when we had to spend money on war, we called our citizens to action. We increased taxes. We sold war bonds. Today, we go to the mall. And then if we think about it, we put a yellow sticker on the back of our truck. During the four years of our country's declared war with World War II, our leaders called the nation to sacrifice, and the nation responded. 
During the past 25 years of continuous undeclared war, we have not seen similar leadership. And it should be no surprise that our nation has not responded with similar sacrifice. On the contrary, government program spending has increased dramatically, even faster than the funding for combat operations. And instead of using the bully pulpit of the presidency to rally our nation to financial sacrifice, our elected representatives, our, our president, have instead used his power to institute crony capitalism, providing tailored tax and spending credits for those who support or even control him and his administration. And our Congress has followed suit. One presidential candidate, previously mentioned, has cynically used the wars on terror as an excuse for her suspiciously lopsided support from Wall Street. And another has presented his exploitation of bankruptcy statutes as a badge of honor. Again, this is not virtuous leadership. And if that weren't bad enough, we've, struck, or we've strangled our economy further. If you were at Civitas, I hope you had the chance to see Fracking Nation, or Frack Nation. Uh, through excessive and misguided regulation, we are killing our economy, even as we try to outspend it, or successfully outspend it. Our country was conceived and founded and chartered as a re republic, a nation of laws, yet we allow regulations to be made by unelected bureaucrats, and that is killing our economy. This has created an environment that detects innovation, determination, entrepreneurship, industry, efficiency, and competitiveness, all traits for which this country once was known and revered. Again, it's not virtuous leadership. And I probably don't need to ask this question, but I will. Have I depressed you yet? <laughs> That's not what I want, but I want you to see what we're up against. I don't want to drive you into depression, because that will just drive you into apathy. Instead, I want to disturb you. I want to agitate you. I want even to anger you and infuriate you. I don't want to drive you to apathy. I want to drive you to action. And if I were to be a Southern preacher, which I'm not, this is where I get on the soapbox and get my tone on. Because it should disturb you when we have allowed our country to be drugged down from a diplomatic powerhouse to a diplomatic laughing stock. That our enemies laugh, laugh in derision while our allies shake their heads. Because promises have become punchlines. It should agitate you that we have muzzled our country's intelligence professionals and their efforts to collect, analyze, and act against our enemies. While we have mobilized them and even created new agencies to exploit and surveil our own people. It should anger you that we have exhausted our military's personnel and material and the blood, sweat, and tears of our troops and their families in seemingly limitless, undeclared wars without a coherent strategy for success or even a notional commitment from the rest of our nation. And it should infuriate you that despite our elected representatives' oaths to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, that calls us to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity, that our leaders instead have chosen not only to burden future generations with crushing debt, but also to destroy the industrial, agricultural, and entrepreneurial economy for which our progeny perhaps could deal with the troubles we've given them. And that those leaders have done so for the most cynical reasons, to line their own pockets and to achieve their own ambitions. Does this disturb you? Yes. Okay. Does it make you agitated? Yes. yes. Angry? Yes. Furious? Yes. Good. So now what are we going to do about it? And that's the most important talk, part of this talk. I got 15 minutes to get through it here. Well, here's the good news. America will rise just like a phoenix from the ashes. We are going to raise a new group of leaders, of virtuous leaders who will serve our nation rather than their networks of power. We are going to raise leaders who will follow constitutional standards instead of changing cultural norms. And most importantly, we are going to raise leaders who will seek God's will and not man's lusts. And furthermore, we are going to raise a generation of leaders to follow them, a generation of virtuous leaders, not to call our nation back to what it was, 
but to lead our nation to what it can be. A nation blessed with unparalleled riches and unmatched opportunities to meet its calling to be that city on a hill, a beacon of hope in a hurting world, the symbol of a renewed and revived American dream. And that's the challenge of virtuous leadership. The challenge of virtuous leadership is doing the right thing when the legal, the ethical, the moral, and the right don't line up. Because when we can raise virtuous leaders who can decipher this, we will be able to conquer a challenging world. You know, leadership seems really easy when everything lines up. When the, we go to the, the schools of leadership, they tell us we can use technique X or technique Y. We can use trans, uh, transcending leadership. We can use servant leadership. What we need to do is start with virtuous leadership because leadership is not practiced in a laboratory setting. It's practiced in the real world. And the most difficult times are when we can't line up legal, moral, ethical, and right. What I mean by legal is obviously the, the rules, the regulations, the laws that we have to live by. The moral is, are the internal codes that we've been raised to hold important. The ethical are the, the, the standards that our, our organization or our profession or our country demand. And the right is the most important. What is defined as God's will. And that's probably the hardest thing to divine. You know, it's easy again. Well, I, I'm sorry. Got off my, my text here for a second. It all has to start, obviously, with having that firm foundation of recognizing that there is truly a right in the first place. I like to think of, uh, of virtuous leadership in, in terms of marksmanship. And I'm in North Carolina, so I know there's at least one or two people who shoot here. <laughs> so, okay. So when we talk about this, uh, we've got the target. That's what's right. The target states that we, we can't redefine what the target is. That's what we have to shoot for. Right? That's what's right. Uh, this is my poor representation of a gun. But somewhere in there, there's a gun. There's a front sight and a rear sight that we have to line up. And when everything goes right, we get all those lined up. We pull the trigger. And sure enough, the bullets hit right in the target. And if it were only that easy all the time, I have a friend who collects World War II uh, firearms. It's good to have friends like that. Um, and he's got a bread machine gun just like this, a uh, semi-automatic, but uh, with, with the tripod. And he brought it back to my back pasture once because my son really wanted to shoot it. He was uh, nine years old at the time. And he got it all set up and the sights were all, all aligned. And he put it up on the tripod so that it wasn't going to move. And my son got behind it and pulled the trigger. And sure enough, milk jug exploded. You know, how easy is that? The problem is, Things don't always happen that, that well. Matter of fact, I was out shooting with a, a friend of mine who's a much better shot than I am, but that day, every time he shot, the bullets were going off to the left side of the target. And uh, I was enjoying that because, again, he normally outshoots me. And he gradually was able to move him back in. About the only way he could move him back in, though, was uh, by uh, uh, moving his gun all the way to the right because what we found out was his rear sight had been knocked out of alignment. Um, <laughs> I wish I had thought to do that a few weeks prior, actually. <laughs> when things don't line up, it's a lot more difficult. And one way we can fix that, obviously, is to adjust our aim. Right? If we know that the legal, the moral, the ethical, and right are not lining up, then we can adjust our aim temporarily to get those, uh, those shots on target. And sure enough, he was doing, able to do that by aiming about three feet to the right of, uh, of the bullseye. But lots of times, what we really need to do is fix those sights. Right? To adjust them, get them all fixed, and get ourselves back on target to, to shoot that. I use this illustration to say that often the legal, the moral, the ethical, and right don't line up. And sometimes when they don't, we have to make those tough decisions. Uh, Colonel West spoke at the, the conference this past weekend. He was presented in a situation where he was convinced the right thing was not the legal thing. But if the right thing he believed was the moral thing, but not the legal thing, maybe not the ethical thing. And he made a decision for which he paid consequences. Lots of times we have to make those kinds of decisions. But other times, because we live in a, a republic, we have the opportunity to change those sites. When the legal is not right, it's we the people who have the opportunity to fix that. When the moral is not right, when what we think is right, we find out is not right, then we have the responsibility to fix that. When the ethical is not right, we have the responsibility to change that. 
But what we don't have the responsibility to do, or even the ability to do, is to move that target. And that's what culture wants us to do. When we're shooting off target, they just want us to move the target so that the bullets are hitting the right place. And then we'll call that right. But that's not right at all. What's right is aiming for the right. So what's virtue-based leadership? It's defining what is right, having the right goals at the forefront. For that, we have our right motives. And for all of that, it requires the right foundations. Foundations that this culture is trying to drive us away from, but we're not going to let it. When you have those right foundations, those right motivations, those right goals, you then get to do target focus. Has anyone done target, target focus shooting before? A few people. So a technique, I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a part time law enforcement officer and a little bit of a gun enthusiast. But what we do at close range and even at farther range is often is we focus on the target instead of our sights. We get so used to drawing that firearm, pressing it towards the target, and pulling that trigger so that even before the sights line up with that, with that target, that bullet's going out the barrel and hitting the center of the target. If you do that time and time again and practice over and over and over, you get to the point where it becomes automatic and you know where those bullets are going before that gun goes off, even before you can see the sights. And sure enough, when the sights do come into view, they're lined up. It's the same thing with virtue-based leadership. If we can define what's right, if we can keep our eyes on that target, on what is the right thing to do, not what's the most expedient thing to do, not what's the most pragmatic thing to do, but what the right thing is to do, and we condition our bodies, our minds, to continuously focus on that target, when we act, we will hit that target every time. That right is very important. Mark Twain said, or wrote, I'm sorry, not Mark Twain, sorry, C.S. Lewis uh, wrote, I suppose there are two views about everything. Okay, two views, there are a dozen views about everything. Until you know the answer, then there's never more than one. We live in a country that is incredibly blessed. It is blessed with geography. Now, this country would not be what, what it is today if we were not blessed with the geography that removed us from the world, yet put us in a strategic location to influence the world. We are in a country that is blessed with natural resources, from the, the farmlands to the mines, uh, natural gas and oil, production, minerals, you name it. We have got incredible raw materials. We have an incredible people. People that were willing to stand up to the most powerful uh, military and the most powerful ruler in the world. To stick a piece of paper in his face, back it up with muskets, cannon, and blood, and stand against him. In a war that everyone said that they could not win, but they did. We are citizens of a nation blessed beyond measure. Again, with the resources our geography, our people, blessed by that same creator with ingenuity, skill, resourcefulness, and a sense of adventure. And I believe that within that people is a remnant, a remnant that still hear his voice, his call to virtue, who are ready to respond to that call, to honor him and his blessings, and to stand up for virtue, to lead this nation. So we've got to ask ourselves, as, as, uh, as Dirty Harry would ask, we've got to ask ourselves a question. I'll give us three to ask, actually. How can we be virtuous leaders? How can we identify, support, and encourage virtuous leaders? And how can we develop tomorrow's virtuous leaders? I think I'm on time to finish here. First of all, being a virtuous leader, we've got to start with ourselves. We've got to make sure that we're right, because we're not always right if we're honest with ourselves. We need to start with prayers for guidance. The only one who can bring us to virtue. We also need to pray for our leaders even, and perhaps most especially for those with whom we disagree. Pray for our leaders, pray for courage, and then pray for a way ahead to act. And I challenge you to do this tonight when you go home. Pray that God will show you where he wants you to act and how. 
God says in the, in the scripture again, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Because once we define the target that he's given for us, we can work on being virtuous leaders ourselves. How do we align our efforts with that correct target? If our laws, regulations, customs, ethics, or even our own morals don't line up with that, how can we change that so that we are doing what's right? With whom can we team up with? Like here at ICON, who can we enlist for support? How can we help bring this country back to being a city on the hill? And then the next thing is we need to identify and support other virtuous leaders. We live in a republic. We work with organizations. We live amongst others. Some of the greatest helps to those are going to be the virtuous leaders that we already have, the small group that we have in office right now, and others who can be encouraged to get there. This is difficult, but we need to find them, and we need to support them, and we need to encourage them. And finally, we need to develop virtuous leaders. And we need to start with the youngest ones. Because we've taken a long time to dig ourselves into this hole, and we need to make an impressive cadre of future leaders to dig us out. It's not fair that they've got to do it, but it's going to be their job. When you look around, look for the young people and how you can help them become. There are several organizations even though some of those organizations are under attack, like the Boy Scouts for America, the Girl Scouts, uh, 4-H, uh, Future Farmers for America, uh, even though many of those organizations are under attack, they can still be used for good things to help develop these next virtuous leaders. We need to invest in them. Who are the young people around you that you can influence? Ask yourself that. Are they your children, your, your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, uh, the neighborhood kids? How can you... Pour your life into them and build them into that next generation. Again, one of my favorite scriptures is 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It says, These things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust in reliable men who will be able to teach others also. It's this idea of building on a continual cadre of new leaders, new godly leaders. Where are we going to find all these? Well, here's the good news. It comes from a quote from President Reagan one of his speeches. Well, we find them where we've always found them. They're the product of the freest society man has ever known because the birthright we share as Americans is worth defending. So finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you've learned received and heard and seen and be practice these things and that God of peace will be with you. So ladies and gentlemen, we are in dire times indeed. There is much about what we can be concerned about. There is much about what we can be unhappy, angry, and infuriated about. But we are a country that is blessed and we have a future that God has put before us and we will fulfill that. So let's rise to those challenges of being virtuous leaders in our community, in our government, in industry, and let's build virtuous leaders for the future. Thanks again for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you so much, Icon, for having me here. dismissed, uh, is there a movement for them to organize and make the make the public more aware of what's happening in the military? I don't really hear anything. And um, are they, they at risk of losing their pensions if they speak out? They, well, there is. Under the UCMJ, uh, a retired officer who is drawing a pension is still subject to the UCMJ. Uh, it hasn't been used before, but it, it could be, and, and that could be a threat. Um, uh, 
I would say, I'm, on, I'm under that same UCMJ. Uh, I say things that I would suggest are insubordinate against my, my former commander in chief. Um, but uh, uh, that is a risk. Some uh, senior leaders have come out uh, pretty uh, uh, vociferously uh, through uh, spe uh, special operations speaks. There's one group that uh, some senior leaders have come out. I don't believe the three generals that I uh, outlined really have, and I, and I don't know the reason for it. It may be that there are completely legitimate uh, reasons they're quiet. It may be something else, but, but uh, uh, there are some senior leaders who are coming out and, and speaking about the injustices that, that led them to either quit or be fired. Yes, sir. Thank you for the uh, words tonight. I just had a question You're talking about uh, how to identify virtuous leaders. Would you be willing to go out on a limb? And I would think that the shortest route would be to identify those that are out there now, in your opinion, that we can get behind and support. And then let that move from there. Would you comment on who you feel are the most virtuous leaders, not only in office, but also those that are running? They're running. It's a really good question. And coming from New Hampshire, I have to say that I, I don't put much stock in any of my congressional delegation or my governor. Um, Kelly Ayotte, who is uh, our Republican senator, who we elected uh, to, to follow uh, these virtues, has proven herself uh, unworthy of that, uh, I believe. Uh, is she better than the others? Well, probably. Uh, but is, is she where she should be? Absolutely not. As we look into the national uh, uh, politics, uh, I, I'll say right off the bat, and I, I'm sure there's at least one Trump supporter in here, that the man is not a man of virtue. And, uh, and I would never uh, imagine voting for him as the least of two evils or the worst of two evils. Um, I, I, I don't think that's where we need to go after. After eight years of narcissistic uh, megalomania, uh, we don't need to have four or eight more years of the same thing. And, and that is, would be very dangerous for our republic. Uh, I think we had an incredibly strong Republican field this year, and I think we still do. Uh, I, uh, I disagreed on many uh, subjects with, with most of the, uh, of the candidates, but uh, most of the candidates I could have supported uh, and still can uh, support should they become president. Uh, I, I voted personally for, for Ted Cruz because his positions were closest to mine, but I'd vote for Marco Rubio in a heartbeat, uh, and I'd vote for John Kasich in a heartbeat. And heck, if most of those other people would jump in, I'd vote for them, too. Uh, and, uh, but we'll, we'll have to see what, what's available on that. But uh, you have an opportunity. You know, this is the, the one time that national leaders seem to show up to states is right before the primaries. I haven't seen one of them since February 9th in New Hampshire. Uh, but for a while, we were able to see them. If you've got the time, go there, and, and they, are, they are willing to press the flesh. They are willing to talk to you. Ask them the hard questions. When you look into a, a person's eyes, you're holding their hand, shaking that hand, and you ask them a hard question, you can tell if they're being level with you. If you're honest with yourself, you can tell. Is that person feeding me a political line, or is that person speaking from the heart? They've all got some problems with narcissism. They wouldn't be in the office, <laughs> office if they didn't, right? But is it an illness or just a character flaw? And you can find that out when you shake those hands. <laughs> Anybody else? There's one already there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming this evening. It was great to actually hear your point of view. Um, I'm a recent college graduate, and something that well, I well, sorry, the implication was yeah, the implication was that this general decline speak up. Is oh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> fine. That's sort of breaking in now. Okay. Yeah. The idea that I was put in with a lot was that this general decline is kind of symptomatic of. Uh, the, the cycle of empires, America's recent empire kind of declines is something inevitable. Um, but with what you said tonight about virtual leadership, it's a virtuous leadership, is that we need to build that um, in spite of this cyclical decline. So how would you encourage someone of like my age, I'm 24, how would you encourage us to begin this process? Wow, that's great. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here and for being involved and for wanting to pursue, you said international studies is what you're doing? So definitely, we, if we look through all the the uh, great civilizations, we can see a cycle of, of, of rise and decline, and some of that may be inevitable. Uh, I, I would suggest that, that uh, what happens is uh, as, as we gain power, we can see this not just in national uh, patterns, but in uh, individual pa patterns. As people gain power, they lose focus, right? They forget why they, how they got there in the first place. And we see that with bosses, 
and about the boss gets, gets elevated to a new spot. Next thing you know, you're saying, how is he making these decisions? This is not the guy I knew when we promoted him. And uh, the same thing can happen to a nation. We lose uh, uh, the picture of how we got there. We need to regain that picture. As a young person, you're in a, in, in a great situation, but a, a painful one, right? We've given you a complete mess to deal with. Um, but a good thing, I guess, if you look at that is, is when you're in a mess, you've got lots of opportunities to clean up. Um, but get involved, uh, like, like you're doing already by attending a, something like this. Get to know your, your uh, politicians, your elected representatives on the state and local level, but also at the federal level. Uh, I tell people when, when uh, your senator's staff member sees your caller ID on the phone, they should go, oh, no. <laughs> you should be that well known. If they're doing well, they should be thinking, oh great, this person's here to call me up and tell me what a great job I'm doing. But if they're not, they should dread picking up that phone. But they've still got to, it's their job. So, um, so, so get involved, get to know them, go and visit them. Uh, let them know that you're not, it's nothing personal, you just expect great things from a person who is in a position of, 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 of great responsibility. Um, uh, as you look for what you're going to do with your career, uh, it doesn't have to be something in politics. Uh, that's maybe a good thing for some people. Uh, but you have opportunities to influence people. People have poured a lot into your life to get you to where you are right now. Whether it's your parents or school leaders, teachers, uh, community leaders, people have poured a lot in, uh, of themselves into you. Do the same thing. Uh, you know, you say you're only 24 years old, there are a lot of people that look up to you already. So be worthy of that. And, I, and I'm sure you will be. Any Lord, other questions? Somebody up here has one. Right, Marlene. I love that I know so much of my audience by name. We love having you. It's on. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Colonel. One uh, question I have is uh, on the subject of war. Uh, you have uh, criticized undeclared war, and there's so much turmoil in the world right now. What do you believe would be the right approach? Yeah, that's a hard question, obviously, but it's, it's one that we elect people to, to do, and we have people to make those, those decisions. Well, first of all, if we're going to go to war, we need to go for the right reasons. We need to have a, a coherent uh, idea of what we're, what we're going to war for. So are we going to eliminate a threat? That's an easy uh, thing we can articulate. We are going to war to stop these people from threatening us. Uh, are we going to war to stop a future war? Wh whatever, to take someone out of power. We need to at least articulate what that strategy is. But beyond that, our Constitution is pretty explicit on how we need to go to war. So the President is the Commander-in-Chief who makes those decisions. And the Congress, though, is the, is the entity that's responsible for authorizing that through a declaration of war, ideally, or at least an authorization. And uh, since uh, Desert Storm, uh, I'm sorry, not Desert Storm, since uh, Iraq and Afghanistan under President George W. Bush, we have not had authorized uh, operations for all of the wars that we've gone to. So we need to decide which ones we want to go to. I'm personally the, of, of the opinion that we need to leave Afghanistan. Um, that, uh, that if we leave tomorrow, uh, I, I completely acknowledge it's going to be a complete mess. Uh, and if we leave in 30 years, it's going to be a complete mess. Um, the only, the only uh, leader that declared victory in, in uh, Afghanistan, well, other than President Obama, um, was Alexander the Great. And the way he did it was after he took over and started losing all his men to insurgencies, he married Roxana, the daughter of a tra uh, tribal chieftain, uh, declared victory, and left. Left him in power. I would argue that our Roxana moment was Osama bin Laden, and we missed it. Uh, but I, I believe it's time to, to pull out. We just we we don't have the heart in our country to, to do it, and so we can't ask our troops to uh, to do that. I mentioned the Helmand Province. We just deployed 500 soldiers from the 10th Mountain Division in Fort Drum to Helmand Pro Province. That was land that we previously occupied that we gave back and trained the the uh, the tribal chieftains and their men who now have sworn allegiance to the enemy uh, with our training and our equipment. Uh, and we're sending 500 troops into probably 30 or 35,000 hardened warriors. Uh, that is not smart policy, and that is not the way we should be treat, treating our troops. Um, I believe that we're at a point where we have declined in our military capability, our military size, 
that we uh, have to retreat to our own borders a little bit and reconstitute. We have not, for the past 25 years, taken the chance to redeploy, reconstitute, and replenish our troops. And we need to do that before further adventures. Yes, sir. Are you in favor of returning to the draft? And if not, why not? <laughs> it's a tough question. Uh, it depends on the day. Uh, about one half of one percent served today, uh, in, uh, compared to uh, what 10, 15 percent World War II. Um, when I run into a person that has no idea that we're in Afghanistan right now, losing people, you know that someone like Sergeant Matthew McClintock dies and nobody knows his name or even that he's in combat. When a friend of mine in that Fort Drum unit, uh, his wife uh, uh, is asked by a very well-meaning person, what are you so sad about? Well, my, my uh, husband's going to have to deploy again to Afghanistan. What do you mean deploy to Afghanistan? We're not there anymore. When I meet people like that, I want the draft. Because the one thing the draft would do would make it real for everybody else. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Having been uh, stationed with troops from other countries that do use conscripts and seeing uh, the effect of untrained people in a, in a highly advanced type of war, I can see the arguments against it. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it's a hard, hard choice. I, I would love to see a national service requirement, uh, wh whether it's military or, uh, or otherwise. One thing I'm not for, though, sir, is uh, that our that our uh, our current administration is for is I am not for drafting our women and uh, uh, you know my daughters will not. Come out um, yes, sir. Yes, I have a question. How do you raise virtuous leaders, especially when we try to make our children? individuals of character and integrity, but the school systems tell them that they are wrong, that we send them to college and they are told that their beliefs are wrong by people that have initials after their name and that their biggest concern is not their tests, not what they're doing, but that the First Amendment is scary. That's a great Yeah, um, no safe spaces in our house, by the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're, I have to say that I think our entire system of public education is broken. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's pointing in the wrong direction. And, uh, although there are some great schools and some great teachers, and I appreciate uh, those, that the entire system itself is, is a broken system. Uh, we're homeschoolers. Uh, we do that very intentionally, uh, because uh, um, not because we don't think there's any way that, that our kids can get a great education in public schools or private schools or charter schools. We just really felt led to do that. A friend of mine says that homeschoolers are the true rebels, uh, and the true radicals in, in today's society, and I, I hold that true. Inside the public school, though, you need to know, uh, if, if your kids are public school, and many of us have to do that, um, uh, you need to know your constitution. You need to know your constitutional rights. You need to know the organizations which will support and defend you when you come into conflict. You need to know the, the difference between the establishment cause and the free exercise clause when we talk about uh, religion. You need to know what free speech is and what the rules are regarding free speech, because students' free speech can be restricted uh, according uh, to, to the principles of, of case law. However, it cannot be restricted the way that many administrators try to do it. Uh, when, uh, when those rights are infringed, then you need to go after them. And that's tough, and that can result in lots of uh, emotional uh, and even financial pain, but we need to hold our people accountable to the Constitution that frames our republic. Um, raising virtuous leaders is not easy. Uh, as, as a dad, I'm sure you, you've seen that. I, I, I've got three kids, and, and I, I'm incredibly proud of them, uh, and my wife has done most of the work because I've been deployed a lot of the time that, that she was raising them, um, but it, it's not easy. Uh, I'm very proud of, of, of the young uh, man and woman that they are becoming, um, but uh, it's, it's something that we have to do, and I think the, the best uh, way I can illustrate is the target focus thing. We just have to continually point to what is right, point to that target. This is where we're going, and create that muscle memory so that we're hitting that target. Thank you. Could I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the issue of um, uh, having, instead of having a draft, having service corps, uh, uh, came up, 
and um, I, I might be interested in that as a solution. However, it seems to me it's just another opportunity to have another couple of years of indoctrination, and I can't imagine that it wouldn't turn into that. I think it, it very well could be, uh, just like other, uh, uh, other administrations have done where we turn a lot of that stuff over to faith-based organizations. I think we ought to allow that to, to uh, count. It, we have, right now, we have a, a, a presidential candidate who's, who's uh, making a lot of uh, noise about free college. You, you know, college can be free right now. And it's not, you know, the, it can definitely be free if you go through the military. But you can, you can, get, your, you, you can get your college uh, debts repaid through national service. You can go be a teacher in a disadvantaged area and you will get your loans repaid. You can go be a doctor in a disadvantaged area and you will get many of your loans repaid. You can go join the Peace Corps and you will get them, you will get them forgiven. There are many opportunities for free college. The only thing is, it's not really free, it costs you something. And, uh, and, and so there, is, there, is already, there are already opportunities for this to some extent. Uh, I would like to see people spend a little bit of time though serving something greater than themselves. So we each get to ask the questions as we walk around with <laughs> Would you speak to uh, what you've seen in the military and the oppression of Christianity and what is going on in, in that line that we're hearing a little about, but maybe not as much as we should be aware? Absolutely. Yep. Um, uh, the Founding Fathers were so against religion in the military that, that uh, um, General George Washington instituted the, the chaplaincy while he was a colonel in the Virginia Re Regiment and later brought it to the Continental Army. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, the, the person we attribute the separation of church and state, said that religion was mandatory uh, for effective national government. Um, and that chaplaincy that uh, General Washington established is still alive today, but it's under a lot of attack. And we had a Navy chaplain uh, who recently was, was attacked because of uh, statements he made in his faith. He had a, a, a uh, um, chaplain's assistant who intentionally put himself in a position, uh, he was a, a gay chaplain's assistant, who uh, asked the, the uh, chaplain in confidence, what do you think about homosexuality as a sin? And the chaplain said, well, you're asking you know, Baptist minister, yes, it's a sin. And he told him about that in confidence, uh, not, not as it's against the military's uh, rules and regulation, because unfortunately it is not anymore. Uh, but he said, no, it's, it's a sin. Well, this guy complained, said he was uh, sexually harassed or, uh, uh, um, uh, by this chaplain. And this chaplain was disciplined. He was uh, given a, a, a uh, um, Article 15 punishment, which he challenged and won, by the way. Uh, it was reinstated to his position. But our chaplains are, are under attack, and they are the uh, spiritual backbone of, of our military. Uh, the service that chaplains provide uh, can be either incredibly uh, uplifting and repairing, or uh, the absence of that can be can be devastating. Uh, I've seen uh, um, I've seen chaplains do amazing things for soldiers in uh, just unspeakable uh, uh, depression. Uh, um, we talk about post traumatic stress disorder. I like to just say post traumatic stress. Um, uh, chaplains can do incredible things, and we want to handcuff that. You know, that kind of stuff is what's leading to our veterans killing themselves. Cody, yes, ma'am. Oh. And then Fred behind you, Laura. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd be interested in uh, hearing your thoughts what opportunity or threat you feel there is facing American leadership with the possible diminishment or dissolution of the European Union. <laughs> More of a political thing, maybe our international studies major might be able to give us more on that. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that we're going to see the EU dissolve real soon, but I've been wrong in the past. Uh, uh, the, the EU is, uh, both simplifies and complicates things for us. We've been uh, intricately involved uh, with Europe uh, since, really, since World War II. We were, we were involved with them since our, our nation's founding. But really, since World War II, we've been much closer, and, and, and with NATO, uh, much closer. The EU has added another thing. So now we, we deal with individual nations, we deal with uh, our NATO alliance, and we deal with the EU. And it's created for them some distinct problems that some people thought uh, when the EU started would likely happen. You, 
this, this problem with both uh, a unity uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of Europe itself, but also uh, um, a desire for national sovereignty. Um, uh, were it to go away, I don't think that would be a terrible thing. And if it stays, I don't think that would be a terrible thing. Uh, I think more critically is the, uh, the, the nature of Europe itself uh, under the current uh, immigration uh, problems we're having. Uh, and uh, under the, the current lack of resolve, really, to, uh, to deal with those things with clarity instead of just feeling. Thanks for being with us tonight. You made a nice case for service, uh, services to someone or something. Yes, sir. Um, given that, our great Western traditions that define virtue are under such attack. Why would we serve the people that would do that? That's, um, well, lots of times we serve because, again, we're, we're doing what's right, not, not what makes us feel good. Uh, uh, God called me to love uh, my enemies as well as, uh, as my friends, or probably even more so. Uh, God calls, calls me to serve everybody. Uh, and specifically, he's called me to serve in this nation. Uh, I would argue that uh, it's a small group of people that are uh, that are working against us. Uh, it's a small group of us who are working for us. Uh, the much larger group are, are the people in the middle who are just apathetic, you know, who don't care enough to find out what's happening. And that definitely is injurious. That makes me angry. Um, but at the same time, I've got to recognize that they are not the enemy. They are victims of the enemy. And, uh, and so I still need to serve them. Uh, why do I want to serve them? I, I'll confess right now, I don't always want to serve them. Um, you know, I, I've got a bunch of different jobs I do. Uh, and, uh, and, and one of them uh, involves putting on a uniform and, and, and going out and, and, uh, and protecting some people that, that I don't feel like protecting sometimes. Uh, but it's the right thing to do. And I've got to do what's right, not what feels good. Could you give us the cliff notes on top secret, SAP, classified? Let me log on to my bathroom server. And, <laughs> and, you know, you probably had top secret clearance at some point. Um, what happens to an ordinary person in the military if they expose secrets on their home server or <laughs> okay so there there are uh, there are several uh, different constructs but let me start with the first part of your uh, thing we've got a national classification system there used to be a lot of different levels of we had a thing called cosmics the top secret and everything else but now there's only a few levels of, of classification so it starts with uh, you'll see this a lot of times for official use only and that's classified information but it's not it's just stuff that is intended to, to be kept within a, a certain group. But it's, if it gets out, it's not going to cause any real damage. Uh, from there, uh, we go to uh, confidential. It would be the next level of, of classified information. Confidential could cause some sort of damage. But again, it's not going to require, a, you can lock it in a drawer in, in, in confidential in certain circumstances. You can lock it in a drawer, and, and that would be OK. Uh, from there, we move up to secret. And that's something that we think could, could cause serious damage to, a, to our uh, national security if we're disclosed to people that don't have the need to know or, or ha have a desire or know it to exploit it. Um, and then top secret would be the highest level of classification. And that could cause what we call grave damage. Uh, you know, and then there are several different uh, 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 compartments uh, to, uh, to different levels of, of uh, classification. And one of those is the one that's come out in the news lately, uh, SAP, Special Access Programs. And generally, special access programs are, we don't even acknowledge that they exist. So even saying that you were uh, allowed access to a special access program, somebody who's not accessed or allowed access to that uh, program would put you in violation of our statutes. Um, for a military member, there, there are several ways that you can be prosecuted for that. But for a civilian member, because that's what we're really talking about, I hope, um, uh, is uh, there are, uh, uh, the US code is, is very specific about that. 
And uh, I will argue, um, there have been a lot of emails uh, that have been released from former Secretary Clinton's uh, server, kept in her bathroom, evidently, very secure place. Um, and one of them is, is worthy of an indictment itself. Uh, it's the one where she sent a, an email to her uh, advisor and said, strip the, if you can't get it through, strip the classification to, uh, header off and send it to me unsecured. That is not, that, that is conspiracy to commit a crime against the United States. That conspiracy itself is five years in prison. We want to send her four years in the White House. If anybody uh, that I knew that I worked with had done that, and I had found out about it, it would have been my responsibility to report that to my security manager, and that person would have been prosecuted, and likely would have gone to jail. Definitely would have lost their security clearance uh, until uh, the investigation is complete. Um, and again, we've got a, a woman who will stand up in front of national TV and say it was no big deal. It's, it's just big. Yes, ma'am. Sir. Yes, ma'am. Where, where's Mr. Park today? Mr. Park is sitting at home in his new lounge chair that I gave him for his 87th birthday. <laughs> and I hope he's resting. <laughs> Although he tends to do too much. Um, Benghazi. Let us never forget Benghazi. Benghazi is a stain of the worst kind on our country, and especially on a few people who know what happened. We have fortunately been able to see 13 hours and to hear the story of what happened when we sent no one. Those people went because they had the courage to go forward. They would not stand down. Aren't they setting a wonderful example for the rest of us? Now a question. <laughs> Do you care about Benghazi? And if you do, can you help enlighten us as to what you perceive might be the end result of Benghazi? Will there be a time when we know, and they know that it's over? <coughs> Thank you. Well, to answer the first question, absolutely I care. Um, that's an easy thing to say, right? We care about something. It's like a yellow sticker on the back of our, our, our SUV that says that we support the troops. You know, I, I saw a great sticker the other day. It was a black ribbon that said, God bless our vacuous slogans. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but yes, I, 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 I care about that. Will we know, ever know? Uh, yeah, it may depend on who gets into office uh, for the next four years uh, as to whether some of that gets opened. Um, uh, there may be, you know, Ollie North got in trouble for uh, doing a lot of document shredding. There may be some serious stuff going on, depending on how it goes. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever find out exactly what happened. But I'll tell you, the people that put together 13 hours based on uh, first-hand interviews, uh, first-hand, you know, people working very closely with the script and with, with the production of the movie, uh, we've got national figures who are calling them liars. These are the same national figures who we know are liars. <laughs> When a liar calls someone a liar, you know, I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go with them. I guess. Um, what happened in, in Benghazi? We don't know all the details. Of 13 hours puts on one side, but I'm more inclined to, uh, to uh, follow or, or, or believe. Again, because I know the other sides are uh, the, the people that are arguing the other side are not trustworthy, and they've been proven. Whether we talk about the handling of classified information uh, or through. Uh, uh, several years prior, the Travelgate, uh, um, the Rose Law Firm, uh, the Bimbo eruption, uh, the, the uh, uh, suppression uh, of, uh, of evidence, the perjury, uh, the uh, 
uh, use of constructive force to, to force a young 20-something intern to have sex with the most uh, powerful man in the world. Um, I don't think I can trust those people. And so I'm, I'm more inclined to trust the people who are speaking out against them. Uh, what effect does Benghazi have on us? Well, it's a stain on our nation. Uh, uh, but it's one that we continue. I mentioned what was going on in Marja, Afghanistan. It's another example of us leaving our troops hanging. And fortunately, we, fortunately, we lost one man, Sergeant Matthew McClintock, that, that night. We could have lost many more. We had our best and brightest and hardest working soldiers surrounded by enemy, and we refused to go help them. That is just inexcusable. And imagine if you are the troop that's going into the next conflict, how much confidence do you have that your country will do the right thing if all you can see in the background is that they won't do the right thing? We can't allow this to happen. Yes, sir. Thank you.